Well, thank you, I think. <laughs> that was just a terrific bunch of papers. Thank you very much, uh, Alison, Jennifer and, and Robert. Um, can I invite some questions from the floor? Are you... Hi, this is uh, for um, Jennifer and Robert. Um, I'm particularly uh, obsessed about column orders and column proportions, and it's something that when I look at these types of project, it um, really disturbs me uh, to see these types of columns being executed. And obviously somebody has an idea of how to carve a capital, and somebody's you know, looked at in temperatures, et, et cetera. What's your take on why there is this uh, obsession about the large capital size but a misproportioned shaft and base that we see replicated over and over again because it's very easy to look, look up sources and even get a computer proportioning system to get it right but it seems that, that they don't care about that. So. Is that right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah no, thanks, Singh. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's really f interesting. I think for architects and, and designers also who are here and certainly art historians, uh, the architectural orders are the, the fundamentals of how we create buildings, right? So whether you've got a portico, whether you've got a front door, it really like, you know, the kind of a Trivian order, it should look proper, right? And I think this is really what I was talking to my, um, in the paper earlier is that there's, it's almost like a post-postmodern idea of, of history, of symmetry, of beauty, where there is no sense of irony, there's no sense of playfulness, there's no reference to history at all. You know, this is something that Charles Jenks has talked about in a lot of his works, right? Which is, he could, he could probably put a McMansion somewhere in his continuum, but I think it even defies all of those characteristics, if that's an answer. Is it working? Yeah. I was, um, I was very pleased to hear you talk about that kind of, you know, uh, the ideas of the postmodern and, and, and reflect upon what it might mean um, uh, in terms of architectural theory. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that it really bears, it, it, it's, it's a difficult one, isn't it, for us, because it doesn't bear a lot of detailed uh, theoretical analysis, because simply it's, <laughs> I don't, I wouldn't say it's made um, in a mindful way. I think that it's a series of symbols, a series of codes that are repeated. Capitals are big because that's the big shiny thing that you gild on top of a column. The column is short because, well, you know, the height in a penthouse or whatever is a certain height that's, that's uh, designated by building codes, you know. Um, so those things are kind of, they're afterthoughts, they're not structural. And that's the most important thing. Of course, these are all built, um, Jennifer can talk more to this, but they are all built with metal. They don't need uh, architectural support. Yeah, I was just going to quickly jump in there. I think, Robert, you're absolutely right. And seeing, I mean, it just reminded me that this is what Kate Wagner talks about in her blog is there's two things she describes the rise of the McMansion and this, this hideousness in architecture is mass production and customization. Americans love customizing everything. So if any of you have been to the US, everyone's got stainless steel appliances, a tricked out kitchen, a huge grand entrance, and God knows what else. So I think that maybe also answers why the columns are so out of whack, maybe. I am, um, I actually live in a McMansion. <laughs> Where are you? No, here? I don't. I'm over oh, here. Okay. No, I don't. Well, no, tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just See thought that. perhaps you should say that it was your taste to dislike the Mc McMansions because somebody obviously likes them. I'm not one of them, <laughs> but I'm sure somewhere, somewhere, someone somewhere likes them. If I could address that question, you've actually raised, a, you've done a covert questionnaire because you've raised taste, and I'm going to jump in and talk about taste because it's something that um, I'm very conscious of in my critiques of Trump's taste. I've tried very carefully to critique, critique taste as a historical kind of taste, right? So to, to give a history of taste rather than talk about my personal taste. Yeah. I also wouldn't live in a palace. I mean, I kind of like nice, fancy things, but I wouldn't live in a palace, right? So it's not my personal taste, but I work on palaces. So, the question of taste is an interesting one. How do we deal with taste when we're coming to talk about somebody like Trump? It's very subjective. Well, this is where it's interesting, because yes, it's subjective for what you are I like, but it, it's also a kind of code system of coding, a system of representation. So as historians of design and architecture and, and, and material culture, um, we can talk about histories of style um, that fit certain cultures, and indeed, 
The idea of taste is a courtly idea. If you look at um, you know, uh, you know, the book of the courtier, for example, they talk about taste, the good taste of the courtier. So the taste has, taste has been made historical for us, those people who are working on court culture. It's a very courtly idea. So um, when I talk about taste, when we talk about taste, we have to be very careful that we're not talking about our own taste. Uh, and there is always, always a bit of slippage there. And I take your point, it's a, it's a good one. And I think I'd like to um, also put that back onto Jennifer because you read, mentioned kitsch. And I haven't, come to, I haven't decided whether it is kitsch yet. But, because they're so expensive, right? Kitsch is high, or, high art brought low. Kitsch can be expensive. Hmm. Okay. I, I think so. I think people in the audience might agree with me, right? Kitsch can be pricey. Yeah. Doesn't make it valuable. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so can I, I, I don't want to be the sort of rev representation, representative of the revolution here, but uh, I mean, sure, one of the things that is at stake in this constant repetition by people of the Vanderbilts and the Fricks and all of that, and Trump today, is that um, much is being, in, there is a victim of this. I mean, there, there's an environmental victim, there are, uh, there are social, and other, in other words, I mean, if we are going to take this at its full value, then we must investigate too what, what this treads on, what kind of gross maneuvers this performs, whether that be democracy, you know, in other words, many of the people who made themselves rich over, so it wasn't by being clever, it was by exploit, I mean, sorry to be like, you know, the, 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 the comedy peasant from Monty Python, but you know, <laughs> it, now you see the violence inherent in the system. In a way, there is surely a social critique that can be, can be uttered on the basis of the very same critiques that found excess to be in and of itself wrong that we might wish to address in a very obvious way. It's not simply that it's bad taste, it's that it is, uh, you know, that it has victims, that it has, it has real cost. I wonder if I, I wonder, I, I mean, I'll hand it over to Jennifer in a minute, but I'd like to say that it's true, and Trump <laughs> likes to talk about his Manhattan apartment as the $100 million apartment, and that idea of excess value, extraordinary value that he attaches to these things is grotesque in its own way. But what I find really fascinating, and I hope I brought this out in the paper, was that, in fact, I think for Louis XIV, it was about something else. It was a representation of kingship and the flourishing and wealth of France. It was supposed to be a bigger idea, although it's been read backwards, you know, as being about the hubris of a private individual, as we might read Trump. So this is the kind of historical problem that I'm trying to work out. How do we think about opulence in the past as a form of repre representation of state and monarchic power, as opposed to opulence of a private business individual, which goes against those sorts of, uh, not as you say, it has a kind of moral implication, it had a moral implication for the French Revolution. But I think maybe what Mark might be getting at, and I think I, I have imagined me more pragmatic answer via the seagulls is uh, the people who actually bought into, for example, Westgate Resorts yeah. uh, as a result of the GFC of 2008 suffered greatly when the seagulls went bankrupt, right? So they were selling everything, the Walmart, the, the faux antiques, like, and then they had to actually, you know, liquidate a lot of the stocks that were in that company, and a lot of everyday Americans put their savings into his corporation that was building this incredibly hideous McMansion. And there's another footnote for you, is maybe there's a great movie called 99 Homes. I don't know if any of you have seen that. I think it's this actor named Michael Shannon. He's fantastic. And he goes about basically trying to fleece everyday Americans to buy new homes. So it's a fantastic commentary on the flip side of that. We had a question over here. Uh, can I go back to um, stylistic matters from the political? I, w I wonder how much is the, um, is the adoption of um, Louis XIV, Louis XV style by contemporary squillionaires um, reflective of an emulation of the, of the Gilded Age rather than um, directly by reference to um, 17th and 18th century Europe. It, is, is that the absolutely necessary middle springboard, if you like, to the McMansion? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, new money, making lavish properties. I mean, the thing is, you know, the, in a way, uh, the Vanderbilt properties and so on are kind of like the, the mansions of their day. If you listen to the kind of Goncourse talk about, you know, the new money, the Rothschild and so on, and so on you know, if, in a way, they're, they're criticised at their time for being gauche and poor taste. Uh, but um, is it the necessary springboard? And the other part that none of us have addressed, oh, you did a little, was this kind of the hotel style, the hotel taste. 
you know, op Hot motel. Could I just make the point that with the, the Gilded Age uh, mansions, you had genuine boiserie and uh, fireplaces and, and some genuine uh, items of furniture, whereas the, um, the contemporary manifestation is by and large a reproductive one. That's true, and that I see is a, a difference. And I see that that comes to the, 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 the important point there is that the people that the, um, the, the squillionaires, if you like, of the Gilded Age were trying to impress were the establishment who were of um, old money who had these things. They were sort of naturalized into that kind of aesthetic culture. Whereas the people, I think, that Trump and the Seagulls and so on are trying to impress don't have that history and don't have those... They don't, that's not important to them. They don't need to have the authentic thing. Uh, it's a, it's the Seagulls actually funded part of Trump's campaign, so it's a hideous conspiracy. <laughs> not conspiracy, it's true. Um, I have a, an observation rather than a question for um, Robert um, regarding um, Donald Trump and the parallels with Louis XIV. And I think one key aspect is not only uh, the visual arts but also language and the rhetoric of supremacy and superlatives, which I addressed in my paper yesterday. Because I think that's something, if you look at the rhetoric of Louis XIV, um, when he's described as the greatest monarch of the universe and, uh, and, and the ambassador staircase being the, the plus beau lieu de la terre, the, the most beautiful place on earth. I think that's, some, that's a rhetoric that, in a way, that this rhetoric of superlatives has been ingrained in uh, American politics long before Donald Trump arrived. I mean, this idea of the greatest country or the greatest um, a democracy in the world, um, and indeed, you know, he says he's the most presidential person, and in a funny sort of way, or not so funny sort of way, it's something that has crept into the rhetoric of other politicians, like the, um, like the mayor of London, who now says London is the greatest city in the world, which to, I think, other Europeans might sound slightly like a petulant child, saying, you know, my, you know I don't know, my city is the greatest, but I think that's, that's really um, is key, that idea of, of superlatives for uh, for Donald Trump, and I think one thing that um, one needs to do now when you're looking at it is, is to see if there's any distinction between Donald Trump, the, uh, the billionaire or so-called billionaire, uh, and now th the president, whether he changes anything in his attitudes towards interior decoration, because so far the only thing he's done is brought in new curtains into the Oval Office, but that's it, I think, so far. I, I wanted to thank uh, Jennifer for giving us one Chinese example because I think in the Middle East and in China you now have a wave of people following the American Versailles style because it's linked to capitalism and, and financial uh, fortunes. But I have a question for Alison. Sorry to drift away from Trump, but I had quite enough over the last <laughs> year. Um, I wanted to ask, did, did your artist um, select to exhibit in Versailles, or was it a curator's um, ambition and idea to bring the two uh, visual concepts together? There is a, there is a connection between um, Murakami and the director of the chateau through Francois Pinot and through um, a gallery called uh, Emmanuel Perrotin in, in France, in Paris. So um, just like there was a connection with Jeff Koons as well, I think Murakami and Jeff Koons were, you know, at the pinnacle at that time. They were collected by Pinot and so there's a kind of connection there. But I think what's interesting is that the works, some works were made, obviously intended to be shown at Versailles, like the um, Oval Buddha, the gold and the silver one, but other works already existed. And so there's a very interesting kind of um, positioning of certain works within particular rooms to make comment. Does that answer your question? Um, I don't know that the gallery pushed for it, but Pino, he owns um, Hiropin and My Lonesome Cowboy in his collection, so there would have been some discussions happening, I'm sure, behind closed doors. So, I mean, there was criticism at the time of this connection, but there were other artists shown at Versailles, so it's just that he's perhaps Japanese and a bit more controversial. Just 
No, no, I'm not mentioning Trump. No, I just wanted to add to that. Um, no, because I think that there's also, there's often links between Versailles and the great Parisian fashion uh, houses. And, um, and obviously he, at the time, uh, pretty much exactly at that time, did all the, a, a huge campaign with Louis Vuitton. So yes, exactly. I think there may be a link there too. Yes. And, and just a comment about um, the connection between Donald Trump or other people in America <laughs> taking on the, the Versailles style. It, it may be just that, um, if you think about the Statue of Liberty and the kind of idea of movement between America, because I'm very interested in transcultural flow, the movement between America and France, you know, France for food, for fashion, for all things cultural, was always held in great esteem. So it's more about a continuation of very broad influence, I would have thought, that just then manifests itself as well in the architecture. But, you know, they would be buying French clothing and eating French food and drinking French wine and, you know, so, yeah. What I was just going to add maybe to what you've said, Alison, is also, and I liked what Mark and uh, Lucina and Robert wrote in the uh, introduction to this conference, is also about, like, disrupting some of that continuity in, in very massive very um, ideological type of ways that we haven't foreseen in the 21st century, particularly like Florian pointed out, the Middle East and China, and the you know the Chinese relationship to France is I think also very different than that of uh, the U.S. Certainly. Um, can I just add that there's also a phenomena with Japanese tourists going to Japan, uh, going to Paris, where they're so overwhelmed by the the reality of being in the space that they become quite sick, and it sometimes is out of disappointment and sometimes it's out of just sheer joy. Someone help me out here, who was next? <laughs> Who's got the microphone? Terrific, please go ahead. <laughs> um, I have a question for Alison. I was really interested when you said that there was a lot of protest against the um, exhibition, and I was wondering if that's because it was contemporary Japanese art in such a historically French space. And do you think it would have been received any, any differently if it was a French contemporary artist being displayed there? They, they have had French contemporary artists there and there was no protest. They did protest a little bit with Jeff Koons, but probably um, maybe Jeff Koons' things were a little less um, offensive, perhaps. You know, there were large hearts and, you know, I think Bubbles and Jeff Koons were there, and Michael Jackson and Bubbles were there and... Uh, the puppy, they had the puppy in flowers. So, um, yeah, maybe maybe the Japanese thing is a bit of an issue, um, but, you know, it's not very apparent, it wasn't made very apparent. Could I, could I, sorry, address that slightly? Because I'm afraid um, I'm going to confess that I would have been on the barricades. I mean, it's something I feel very strongly about. Uh, the, the display of contempt, so sorry, Alison, I know that. And I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate here a little bit, you know, to, to keep the conversation lively. But... Um, the idea of taking those big Murakami... I like Murakami <laughs> in the right place. But the idea of taking Murakami and popping him, you know, in the Salon de la Bonance that obscures the kind of iconography of that room, you're going to Versailles once. You're going to Versailles and you're expecting to be overwhelmed by a particular kind of an iconography, a particular kind of program. And there's this ugly, great silver thing in the way. Um, OK, you could make arguments for it being there and so on, but I'd like you to... I'm, I'm pro provoking you slightly here, um, to, to answer that. I mean... What do you say in the defense of Murakami, uh, or, and Jeff Koons and the others, um, against uh, the attack of a, a purist saying that, you know, actually, take it away, let's see the real thing? Well, is it really about defending Murakami or defending the president of the chateau and the curator? Because they're the ones who are choosing the artist. They're the ones that are dis deciding to do this site activation. And clearly, um, they're quite happy with it because there was a 20% increase to Versailles in that one period of time and 49% over the entire year. So, you know, obviously being in the news is a good thing. Yeah. So, I mean, there was restorations and, you know, flagging uh, numbers, visiting, and so maybe they've reinvigorated the, the whole um, beauty and power of Versailles. And, 
in attracting new audiences. I was going to say that brings up the, the age-old concept of site specificity. And, you know, from architectural and I know artist points of view, it's all about, okay, how can we measure the ambiance of this particular space, dimensions, you know, empirical things, but you also have the, the kind of, um, the feel of a particular site. So I imagine that the interiors of Versailles and the, the exterior grounds as well, they're all specific in certain ways. So I guess it may, may be up to the curators to decide, like, how do they define that? Can we just conservation and other things. We have two questions, people waiting very patiently here. Hello, yes, uh, Robert, you kind of stole my thunder with that one, but it's okay. <laughs> I'm coming in with a question. Yeah, so I was just wondering, with the Murakami exhibition, with all the pieces in, the, um, in Versailles, were they explained in context, like was it describing in the exhibition the rooms they were in and the situations and history of those rooms, or were they just kind of <coughs> plonked in there with the aesthetic value of the rooms behind them? Like, did the exhibition just use Versailles as a place for it to be, or did they try and link the two together in explaining that? Well, the catalogue um, tends to, to just talk about Murakami and not so much about the room. I mean, there's a little bit of a relationship, but um, you have to wonder how much people take in anyway when they go to see an exhibition. How, I mean, sometimes pe there are a percentage of people who will read excessively labels and take in everything. And there are other people that just want to go for a kind of uh, more intuitive e experience, to put it a better way. I mean, it's a massive site. It's overwhelming. And so I think for a lot of people, they would move from one room to the next and not really take in either Murakami or the space, apart from its name. And that's just the nature of the space and the nature of people who go to visit. But then on another level, there'll be people who know a great deal of detail about architecture, about history, about design, you know. So, yeah, I can't make a kind of small, neat package for you, I'm afraid. <laughs> No, that was fine. And then I was also wondering, this is kind of a broad question, <laughs> but just with, and you said there's been other exhibitions held in Versailles, with that and with future ones, more and more often the style of Versailles, like talking with all the architecture, how it's become so much an aesthetic symbol, but then you forget that it was this building with all this history. And like, you could show someone a picture of the Hall of Mirrors and they'll be like, oh yeah, that's that glitzy French stuff, but then like, are we losing a connection to the history of the building and is it becoming just an aesthetic or is it, you know, still retaining that it's, you know, Versailles, the palace or whatever? Well, perhaps if you think about Murakami as coming from Japanese culture and the, you know, love and fascination that they have for the French culture and for Versailles, then maybe um, the people that are travelling there come with a whole different kind of interpretation of site and a renewing of that understanding of site and definitely some of the comments in the press young children were saying you know making connections between the space like they're attracted to the the anime character but then putting it into a historical context gave them a new in I suppose to something that was so completely foreign to them something familiar in a, some, in a, in a foreign space so again it's a very complex and I don't think anyone's really uh, well, well, and that's that was your that's your answer. And of course, we have did we come from different positions? My my worry is that it it limits the kind of hist the depth of historical engagement with the original palace. And that, that's enough to, for me to say. But I think that there's a there's an interesting conversation to be had around that. But I mean, I, I think I could see myself taking Alison's side on this one. You know, I'm, I'm in the middle technically, but um, I'm, I mean, really, if you look at and this is maybe the answer to your question there in the audience is. Um, to some degree, most of the shows you see around Versailles and Paris um, have some commodification uh, commercial angle to it, right? So a lot of, particularly we were talking about Japanese tourists and the Chinese who go to see Paris monuments, right? A lot of it is about this souvenir collecting, right? They want to take a piece of Paris with them. They want to go see the Eiffel Tower. They want to see the Lac de Triomphe. They want to uh, have the keychain, the stationery, the Louis Vuitton bag, and like it's a whole deal. So a lot of Asian tourists, I think, and this is what you were getting at, it's, it's kind of a whole experience. And it just seems like the building uh, and I could also see your side of this too. It's like they want to have that ambiance so they can just package it and then take it away with them. Plus, I, if, plus it's hard for me to see that as a positive. <laughs> I know, I know. I plus, know. plus if, you see, if you see places like the Grand Palais, you know, where things are changing all the time, 
people would come back to Versailles having seen it before Murakami and seeing it with Murakami and then seeing it again after Murakami. You know, and that's the thing. They want to have site activation, which means that every experience you have when you come there is a different experience. Yeah. So um, it happens at Picasso Museum as well. I mean, it, it, it's not that it's right, but it's not that it's wrong either. It's just different. <laughs> Wolf has been very patient back there. Uh, just in, in the interest of time, uh, excuse me, with the microphone, does your question, um, is it specific to our speakers here or would it make sense if I was to ask now for all the speakers to come? It can probably wait. I think it could be applicable to multiple. Should, should we yeah. do that? Could yeah, we ask everyone?